I've always kind of believed that um, when you come into this world with big dharma, and I obviously have, then um, what accompanies that is big challenges, big obstacles, big difficulties. Many of you know I spent the first nine years of my life in a series of foster homes and orphanages. I don't look back on that as anything other than a great opportunity for me to learn self-reliance as a young boy and then consequently teach people about self-reliance, which is what I've been doing for 35 years or so with uh, 30-some books and programs of all sorts and so on. It isn't to say that those nine years weren't filled with some, uh, some heartaches and some sadnesses and, uh, you know, missing your mommy and things like that. But uh, my mom, who is uh, almost 94 now, um, in a hospital tonight, having a pacemaker put in on Tuesday, at that age, that's, uh, that's a challenging thing as well. I've been through a lot of the kinds of struggles. I mean, we had nothing when I was younger. Um, everything I have is what I earned. I look upon that as a great advantage. But it was uh, just the Dharma that I chose, I guess. I've been through divorce twice. Uh, I know what that feels like. I know the heartache of breakups and have lived with them and struggled with them and have used it to help me to become a better person, a more compassionate, kinder person who listens more than he talks. I've been through the addiction route in my life um, and struggled with it on many different levels. From alcohol, which I can proudly say it's been 22 years since it's crossed into my body. Yeah, thank you. But the previous 22 years, I drank enough to make sure that these 22 years were covered. So. Uh, and not just alcohol, but drugs as well. I've been down that road and, uh, and know, know what it feels like and know the struggle of it and the pain of it. Uh, but Elizabeth Kubler-Ross said, uh, if you shield the mountain from the windstorms, you'll never see the beauty of the carvings. So the storms of our life uh, if we try to shield ourselves from the storms of our lives, we don't get to see the beauty of the carvings, <laughs> of what those storms bring for us. And virtually every spiritual advance, not virtually, every spiritual advance that you make in your life, that I've made in my life, has been preceded by a fall of some kind or another. I always give the example of when I was in high school, I was on the track team, and I was uh, the high jumper on the track team, among other things. And, uh, the bar would be up here, and we'd get back here, and you run up to the, this is a metaphor for what I'm speaking about, and you run up to the bar, and you run up and get down as low as you can, as fast as you can, and in the process of getting down low, it would allow you to propel yourself over the bar. So the low points of our life are the times when we should be in a state of gratitude, as hard as that is for us to do, but that's what an enlightened being does is they begin to see that, you know, these, these low points in our life, and I've been through some low points in my life, um, very dramatic low points. When my wife and I separated 12 years ago, I mean, I was in a, it was the closest thing that I could call it to a depression for months, months and months. And out of that depression and out of that deep hurt and sadness about breaking up our family, in a sense, because we're not really broken up. But, uh, I was able to uh, to write The Power of Intention, which is the next book after Erroneous Zones that just soared and just took off and sells in the millions all around the planet. Um, and it came from a place of compassion. That it's when you are in those low points that you you have a tendency to reach out to other people with more compassion and more love and more understanding because of what you're going through yourself. So that, um, you know, I think, and this is true, we could give, I could give a thousand examples of that, but the whole idea of it is that um, these low points, the struggles that we go through in our lives are really significant things and look back at them and um, 
you can really, you can do an awful lot of growing from them. So that when you bring higher energy to the presence of lower and slower energy, energy that we call evil, energy that we call disease, uh, energy that we call depression, you are not only sending the disease and the depression and the despair away, you are converting that very energy into the higher and the faster energy that is being brought to its presence. The same thing is true of hatred. When you bring love to the presence of hatred, hatred not only dissolves, but it turns to love. All you have to do is light a candle, turn on a light, and the darkness dissolves. The darkness disappears. But more than that, and this is really crucial for what I'm presenting here this afternoon, the darkness is converted to light. I said that I would like to talk about the three levels of consciousness, A being individual consciousness or ego consciousness. And I said that there are two people inside each and every one of us. The first one is the ego. The second person inside each and every one of us is what I call the sacred or the higher self. And this sacred or higher self really doesn't care whether we win or lose or how much we get or who we're better than or how much we have. It's not interested in that. This part of us that lives in every single one of us only wants one thing. It wants us to be at peace. At peace. And it wants to choose peace. As it says in The Course in Miracles, I can choose peace rather than this. I remind myself that every day when I drive my children to school in the morning and they're fighting over who called shotgun and who gets to sit in the front and who gets to push the buttons and who listens to the rap music and who said, Daddy's my turn this time. And they're going back and forth and I just remind them, I can choose peace rather than this. <laughs> and I said, look out or I'm going to push my button. And they say, okay, okay, okay. They don't want to hear that crappy music or whatever. All right. The ability to choose peace. One of the selections that was most profound in my life that I wrote an essay about to, for 60 Days to Enlightenment and Wisdom of the Ages was uh, from Rabindranath Tagore, the great Indian poet, from a selection called the Gitanjali, which won the Nobel Prize for Poetry and Literature in 1927. He said, I went out alone on my way to my tryst, but who is this me in the dark? I step aside to avoid his presence, but I escape him not. He makes the dust rise from the earth with his swagger. He adds his loud voice to every word I utter. He is my own little self, my Lord. He knows no shame, but I am ashamed to come to thy door in his company. The ego just wants to be right. The higher self wants to be kind, wants to be at peace. And if you can just begin to shift that, just ask yourself, as what I'm about to say, I always tell people this in, in counseling groups and so on, that there are four words, that if you learn these four words, they'll eliminate all conflict in all of your relationships. These four words are, you're right about that. No matter what it is somebody says to you, you give them that. You're right about that. Someone says, you know, you're really a jerk. So you know... You're right about that. Because that doesn't make somebody right. She'll say something to me. You know, you're supposed to be home at 7.15 and it's now 6.30. There was a time when I used to say, wait a minute. You're not my mother. I don't have to explain to you when I come home. I'm the one that's out working. And who do you think support? Who do you think buys all these? You know, there's a whole, all that ego stuff that was a part of my life. You've all heard those before, right? Now I just simply say, you know, honey. She said, don't hold those four fingers up. I hate it when you do that. Now I notice she holds the four fingers up, but she's doing it one at a time. She's going like, you know. <laughs> but it's the idea that just as you're about to respond to somebody, instead of saying, well, I need to be right and I need to prove myself, I'm just going to stop. And just, I am no, no longer. And every single person that operates at these higher levels that I'm describing here tonight, that I've known they have no need to be in charge, to be right, to be dominant, to be in, they allow themselves to, to realize, as uh, 
You know, the story of Buddha when he had someone following him around for three days and all they ever did was criticize him and find fault with him all the time. Everything he said, everything he did, they found... And always what would, what would come out of him would be this peace and this love. And finally, after three days, the man who was criticizing him said, I don't understand. I've done nothing but insult you for three days and make a fool of you and you always respond with, with kindness and love. He said, how, could you, how can you do that? And the Buddha said these magical words. When someone offers you a gift and you don't accept that gift, to whom does the gift belong? So if someone offers you a gift of their anger, their hatred, their insults, but you don't accept it, who owns the gift? And why would you go around being upset about something that belongs to someone else? It's not yours in the first place. That's a higher level of awareness. That's being able to choose peace. How you process and, and perceive yourself is determined not by what other people tell you, as much as you'd like to believe that, but in fact by how you have chosen to process yourself. And what you want to learn how to do right off the bat, at the very beginning, is to understand that disliking yourself or experiencing self-rejection or uh, putting yourself down or finding fault with yourself or looking at your body and telling yourself all the things about it that you don't like like you may be too tall you might tell yourself that you're too short you might tell yourself that you're too heavy that you're too light that you're any number of things and you can go through every organ in your body and some people do this very thing and find all kinds of reasons why they don't like this they don't like that they don't like the size of their their legs they don't like the size of their breasts they don't like the way their hair is they don't like their eyes they don't like their ears their nose is too big they're, it's an endless and this is like uh, a burden that you place on yourself in your life and it's something that you want to really begin to process in a different way and a way to process it is to say uh, what do I get out of this what's the what's the point in me disliking myself or finding fault with myself it's the only self I have instead of doing that and uh, keeping myself miserable what I'm going to do is uh, look in the mirror and say to myself, this is the body that I have shown up in for whatever reason, whether it was my plan, or whether it was God's plan, whether it was my parents' plan, whether it was a conspiracy, whatever, it is still the reality. And I am going to accept the reality of what I have shown up in and see it as my curriculum to a higher place. The body that you're in, whether it's in a wheelchair, whether it's blind, whether it's deaf, whether it's tall, whether it's short or black, white, whatever it may be, it is still your curriculum. It's what you have to use to get to the highest place that you want to be in your life. So rejecting it is really rejecting your entire life curriculum. Uh, and you have to really look at the, the whole idea of, in our culture, it's almost... I think I have been asked the question on talk shows across America more about this particular subject than anything else. And the question is, isn't it selfish? Aren't you promoting selfishness? Aren't you telling people that uh, they should love themselves and reject all other people and so on. And I'd like to put that to rest right here. The first thing you have to ask yourself is what does it mean to be selfish? To be selfish is to be a burden to another human being. Whenever you find yourself a burden to somebody else or someone else is a burden to you, that is a very selfish act. The person who dislikes himself, believe it or not, is the biggest burden to be around in the world. This is someone who is never happy, doesn't know how to make themselves happy, is using other people to uh, try to get them to be happy, is always blaming other people for uh, the, the, the conditions of their life. Uh, the person who has self-doubt or self-rejection uh, uh, doesn't know how to enjoy their life. And being around a person who doesn't enjoy their life is burdensome. The person who does love themselves, who feels good about themselves, who, if you ask the question, do you love yourself, there's not even an issue there. There's not even a question involved. It's simply, of course I do. This is, this is me. This is all I have. Of course I love myself. Why wouldn't I? Why would I ever put myself down? It has nothing to do with uh, being conceited or finding fault with other people or uh, uh, making yourself better than anybody else. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the simple notion that in order for me to be happy, I have to love myself. In order to be able to uh, be free from being a burden to somebody else, 
I have to know how to enjoy my life. If I know how to enjoy my life, it means that I am loving the life that I'm having, and that means I'm loving the body that I'm in, I'm loving the self that I am, and therefore you will not be a burden to anybody else. The person who loves themselves is never a burden to anyone else unless it's conceit, and conceit is just another form of trying to get other people to pay more attention to you. But if it's just authentic self-acceptance, then it is, it is the most important thing that you can do. And in raising children, nothing is more important in the whole educational environment than self-concept, self-esteem. This is what we're trying to teach all the time to young people, is feel good about yourself. Treat yourself, cherish yourself as a, as a valuable, important, significant, grand, divine creature, <laughs> as someone who is unique and special in all the world and feel that way about yourself wherever you go and carry yourself that way. So you have to say to yourself, they didn't do it to me. I allowed it to happen and I am no longer willing to allow myself to be immobilized by the rejection that other people or other events or other institutions or whatever it may be may have uh, attempted to impose on me. So what you want to do at this point is, is if, you, if you can see that that, that there are areas of your life in which you are self-rejecting and identify them and make a commitment to changing them, then you can come up with some specific things that you can do about it. You can begin to, to discipline yourself to select new responses to others' attempts uh, at, at making you feel... Um, at making you feel good. When someone says to you, uh, gee, you look really nice today, you can practice instead of that immediate self-rejecting kind of oh, it really isn't me, or this is my hairdresser, or whatever, you can, you can just, a, a very simple thank you, or it's nice to know that, uh, that you appreciate me. Just, even if you don't mean it, I mean, just, sometimes you have to fake it, but faking it is all right, as long as you are practicing a kind of, hey, I'm, you yeah, know, if someone says to me I look nice, or that I smell good, or that I look nice in this outfit, or that I look younger than I am, or whatever, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm entitled to that. I'm entitled to a compliment. I'm worth that. You can practice saying things like, I love you, and, and check out when someone says that back to you. How do you react to that? What is, the, what is your reaction to that? And accept the I love yous and the caresses and the, and the affection that other people are directing at you as, a, as something that is directed towards someone who deserves that rather than always doubting it and saying, oh, I wonder if he really does that, or I wonder if she really means it, or if, and, and all of the doubting kind of things. I, I, of course you would love me. Your, your attitude, your inner conversation goes, of course you would love me. I'm, I'm worth being loved. I'm a, valuable, I'm a valuable person. Living in the flow. The Tao and water are synonymous, according to the teachings of Lao Tzu. You are water. Water is you. Think about the first nine months of your life after conception. You lived in and were nourished by amniotic fluid, which is truly unconditional love flowing into you, flowing as you. You are now 75% water, and your brain is 85% water, and the rest is simply muscled water. Think about the mysterious, magical nature of this liquid energy that we take for granted. Try to squeeze it, and it eludes us. Relax our hands into it, and we experience it readily. If it stays stationary, it will become stagnant. If it's allowed to flow, it will stay pure. It does not seek the high spots to be above it all, but settles for the lowest places. It gathers into rivers, lakes, and streams, courses to the sea, and then evaporates to fall again as rain. It maps out nothing, and it plays no favorites. It doesn't intend to provide sustenance to the animals and plants. It has no plans to irrigate the fields, to slake our thirst, or to provide the opportunity to swim, sail, ski, and scuba dive. These are some of the benefits that come naturally from water simply doing what it does and being what it is. The Tao asks you to clearly see the parallels between you and this naturally flowing substance that allows life to sustain itself. Live as water lives, since you are water. Become as contented as is the fluid that animates and supports you. Let your thoughts and behaviors move smoothly in accordance with the nature of all things. It's natural for you to be gentle, to allow others to be free to go where they're inclined to go, and to be as they need to be without interference from you. It is natural to trust in the eternal flow, to be true to your inner inclinations and stick to your words. It's natural to treat everyone as an equal. 
All of these lessons can be derived by observing how water, which sustains all life, behaves. It simply moves, and the benefits it provides occur from it being what it is, in harmony with the present moment and knowing the truth of precisely how to behave. What follows is what Lao Tzu might say to you based upon his writing of the eighth verse of the Tao Te Ching. First, when you're free to flow as water, you're free to communicate naturally. Information is exchanged and knowledge advances in a way that benefits everyone. Be careful not to assign yourself a place of importance above anyone else. Be receptive to everyone, particularly those who may not routinely receive respect such as the uneducated or the homeless or troubled members of our society. Go to the low places loathed by all men and have an open mind when you're there. Look for the Tao in everyone you encounter and make a special effort to have acceptance, gentleness and kindness course through you to others. By not being irritating, you'll be received with respect. By making every effort to avoid controlling the lives of others, you'll be in peaceful harmony with the natural order of the Tao. This is the way you nourish others without trying. Be like water, which creates opportunities for swimming and fishing and surfing and drinking and wading and sprinkling and floating and an endless list of benefits by not trying to do anything other than simply flow. And secondly, let your thoughts float freely. Forget about fighting life or trying to be something else. Rather, allow yourself to be like the material compound that comprises every aspect of your physical being. In The Hidden Messages of Water, Masaru Emoto explains that we are water, and water wants to be free. The author has thoroughly explored the ways in which this compound reacts, noting that by respecting and loving it, we can literally change its crystallization process. If kept in a container with the words love or thank you or you're beautiful imprinted on it, water becomes beautifully radiant crystals. Yet, if the words on the container are, you fool, Satan, or I will kill you, the crystals break apart, are distorted, and seem confused. The implications of Emoto's work are stupendous. Since our consciousness is located within us, and we're essentially water, then if we're out of balance in our intentions, it's within the realm of possibility that our intentions can impact the entire planet and beyond in a destructive way. As our Creator, the Eternal Tao, might put it, Water of life am I poured forth for thirsty men. Do the Tao now. Drink water silently today while reminding yourself with each sip to nourish others in the same life-flourishing ways that streams give to the animals and rain delivers to the plants. Note how many places water is there for you, serving you by flowing naturally. Say a prayer of gratitude for this life-sustaining, always-flowing substance. You see, when you get enough inner grace or inner peace or serenity, whatever you want to call it, and you feel really positive about yourself, it's almost impossible for you to be controlled and manipulated by anybody else. I'll give you an example. Just yesterday, I had to get on an airplane and fly to Chicago. Now, I got on the airplane at 1 o'clock in the afternoon in Fort Lauderdale. The plane took off and flew for 30 minutes, and they couldn't retract the landing gear. They were stuck in the down position, so they had to land the plane in Miami, go back and land it in Miami, because they had longer runways. It wasn't an emergency, but I wasn't convinced that they had that foam out there on the runways because they were just seeing if their foam equipment worked. Right? Yeah. <laughs> they were trying to convince us there was no emergency, and that those ambulances weren't just standing by in case anybody fainted while they watched us land that there was, in fact, some emergency. And I watched people around me on the plane when we were having to do this, and some people were panicked and fearful and scared. There was a one couple that jumped and screamed, and there was a lot of interesting reactions, a lot of ashen looks and a lot of very scared people. And I looked at myself, and I didn't have any of that. I didn't have any of that. It was okay, and I knew I was going to be okay, and I saw myself being okay. It wasn't that I tried very hard not to be fearful, it was that inside of me, there is something that has replaced that fear, and that is called grace or serenity, and it was okay. It was just simply all right, and I was fine. In fact, I was effective. I calmed down the guy next to me. I looked around to see where the emergency exits were, because I wanted to know how to get out of this place. I used my mind in a situation where other people might elect panic. I was electing to be conscious to be intelligent, to save myself if necessary. 
And I wasn't the least bit afraid. And I know I would have been afraid at an earlier time in my life. That fear, that potential for fear, has been replaced by peace and fulfillment and knowing that when it's my turn, it's my turn, and that's okay too, and that I'm not afraid of any of that. So we landed, okay, and everything was fine. And there was a computer part that was missing that wouldn't give the right signal for the landing gear to go up, so they had to replace the part, and they canceled the flight. And 192 people were on this plane, and it was full. It wasn't an empty seat. It was the last week after Easter break, there's no seats out of South Florida at all. They announced, the first thing they did was announce that there would be nobody getting a seat out of South Florida because you just can't get one on all the airlines. They're all filled up. And you probably will have to be here a couple of days until we can do something about it. And they even announced that they weren't going to put us up in a hotel. There was like all of these negative things. And I watched the people around me. Now, a minute ago, they were worried about whether they were going to be alive. Now, suddenly, they're alive and they're relieved about that. Now, they're angry because the plane isn't going to take off or they're going to have a replacement. And so there's all this anger. Now, I believe in looking for solutions, never looking for problems. So when the plane landed, they said, no one can get off the airplane. But I knew they probably weren't talking to me, okay? <laughs> because as soon as it landed and the door opened, I went out and called my secretary and said, I have to give a speech tomorrow morning in Chicago, and there's a lot of people depending on me to be there. There's 500 people waiting to hear me speak, and we've set up this date in advance. I see myself in Chicago. I know I'll be there. 191 other people didn't believe they would be in Chicago and acted just that way. They were angry. They were upset. They were yelling at the people. They were letting their blood pressure get out of control. And they weren't doing anything. I said to my secretary, I will call you back in 15 minutes. She was in Fort Lauderdale. I'll call you back, collect in 15 minutes. Just make sure I have a seat on a plane, no matter what it costs or what the inconvenience or what to get me a seat. At the moment that she called... Somebody the moment before had canceled on another airline a first-class seat. They had just canceled, they weren't going. And I was able to get that seat because the person that she called handled the cancellation, and she just replaced me on there, okay, instead of going through the whole list. And I had a seat on a flight that was five hours away. But I still had a seat on a flight to get in much later than I anticipated. And I went down and got my boarding pass, and I was out of 192 people, there was only one that made it to Chicago. And I was that one, not because I'm smarter than everybody else or because I know anything that other people don't know or because I'm better than anyone else. It was because I look for solutions, not for problems, and I refuse to be victimized by my need to be right through using anger and being upset and so on. When you are able to visualize yourself doing something, you start acting on that visualization or that image. You're able to make things happen when you're looking for solutions that you can never make happen when you're more preoccupied with being a victim.